Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, I started with them in um, welcome to, I don't know, is this the sixth, the, the sixth public forum um, convened by the National Taxpayer Advocate to discuss the IRS future state and the needs of taxpayers and their representatives, both today and in the future. Um, I'm thrilled that we're all here in Washington, D.C. on this, again, a rainy morning um, and cold in May. I don't know what that's all about. Um, but uh, we have a full program today, and so I want to just set up how we're going to proceed. Um, the, we're going to have three panels. Two panels will be in the morning, and um, then we'll take a break for lunch, and then we'll go into the third panel. Um, we'll go from the first panel directly into the second panel, and then after the second panel, we'll open the floor up for comments and discussion from the floor, the audience, anybody wanting to make any comments. We do ask that you go to the microphones because we do have, so people can hear, but also because we have a court reporter here, and that person needs to be able to hear clearly what's being said and recorded. Um, I, a few housekeeping items. Uh, uh, the, we, if we break for lunch, if you want to be have lunch in our stellar ha, um, IRS cafeteria, rather than going outside and going through security again, you can gather outside in the lobby and my folks will take you in because we can't allow um, non-IRS employees to wander around the building unescorted. So um, just keep that in mind at the end and I'll remind you all. Um, the first panel, how we're going to do this is that I will just introduce briefly each of the panel members and each one will go for about five minutes. Um, I won't pull the hook out after five minutes, but I will start sending little notes down the table saying you've got one minute, you know, to go. And um, that's just so we can have enough time for discussion. I'll ask a series of questions of the panelists after they've each made their presentation. Um, uh, so let's, you know, basically designed to get some some issues discussed, and also because we're doing forums around the country, and I'm very interested to hear the perspectives of folks representing different populations and different parts of the country on the same issue. Um, so it's been neat to hear what people say in different parts of the country. All of the transcripts, including this one, will ultimately be posted on our website dealing with the public forums, and you all have the web links to that, to those materials or to that website. Um, I'm slowly waiting through all the transcripts now, and they're fascinating. So our first panel is really quite stellar. Um, we first have Larry Gibbs, Lawrence Gibbs, and um, he really needs no introduction. He's a former commissioner of the Internal Revenue Service, and um, he is just a wonderful person. He's on the board of Tax Notes, and since 1994, he's been a member of the law firm Miller and Chevalier. So I, I, you know, Larry is just, I'm so grateful that he has agreed to appear and, and talk about his concerns um, and thoughts on the future state of the IRS and some of the issues that are really um, predominant as we think about the future state. Our next panelist is Carolyn Bruckner, and Professor Bruckner is on the faculty of American University's Kogod School of Business, and she's also the managing director of the Kogod Tax Policy Center. Um, and previously, she worked on the U.S. Senate Committee on Small Business and Entrepreneurship, and she ultimately served as chief counsel there. Um, and she actually came up, she actually attended our first forum on February 23rd here and came up to me to talk about the issue that she's talking about today on the sharing economy. And since no good deed goes unpunished, I said, well, you can be a panelist on our next public forum in Washington, D.C. And that's how I recruit people for this stuff. So watch what you say to me. Um, Mary Louise Serrato is our next panelist, and she is the executive director of American Citizens Abroad, which is headquartered in Washington, D.C. It's a 501c4 whose mission is to advoc educate, advocate, and inform the U.S. government and inform the U.S. government and U.S. citizens living and working overseas on a number of issues. And they have been very active in the tax dealing with the tax issues, particularly FBAR, the offshore initiatives, settlement initiatives, and FATCA, um, and really trying to highlight um, with several other organizations that she works with um, 
the, the problems that Americans overseas are experiencing as trying to navigate the United States tax system. And our last witness on this first panel is Jeanette Hartnett. And she is the Senior Director of Strategy for Strategy and Research for the National Disability Institute, where she co-founded the Real, Im Real Economic Impact Tour, which is a revolutionary free tax preparation and asset building initiative that has served over three million taxpayers with disabilities. And she works very closely with IRS SPEC. Now, as you can see, for all but Larry, um, we have three different and diverse populations being re represented here. And um, that is by design. We are trying to learn the needs as we go around the country of specific populations. Um, so two weeks ago when I was in Red Oak, Iowa with Senator Grassley, we heard from the, I call them the farmers of America, but the agricultural sector. And so today we're going to hear about the sharing economy, the U.S. citizens overseas, and taxpayers who have disabilities. So without further ado, I'll turn this over to Larry, and you can either stand up or you can sit down. It's really up to you. Nina, I think I'll stay seated. Is the mic okay? You hear? You want to hear? Nina, I'd like to begin by thanking you. Uh, for giving me this opportunity to return to Boutwell Auditorium uh, and to the Internal Revenue Service, but much more important than that, thanks for doing what you're doing in terms of going around the country and give, giving everyone a chance to talk to you and to the Internal Revenue Service about the future state of our revenue system. Easy to demagogue the Internal Revenue S Service as an agency much more difficult when you think about our revenue system. And that fits right in with what I would like to chat with you about today, and I'm gonna stay pretty close to my script. The concern I wish to address today is the theft of taxpayers' social security numbers that are then used by crooks to file fraudulent tax returns to obtain refunds to which they are not entitled. This is a serious and a growing problem. To a very large extent, the reason for the theft and the fraud is that the crooks are claiming bogus refundable credits like the earned income tax credit on fraudulent tax returns that they are filing. The earned income tax credit program is really a spending program that once was a welfare program which another federal agency, Health and Human Services, was responsible for administering. In the 1970s, HHS's welfare program was turned into a tax program that the IRS has been administering since that time, a change that the then-serving IRS commissioner strongly opposed. I know because I was here in this building at that time as an assistant commissioner to the commissioner. When HHS ran the welfare program, those wanting to qualify for welfare benefits had to contact HHS to prove they were qualified before they could receive welfare benefits. Now, anyone who wants to receive benefit payments simply files a tax return and claims that they qualify for the EITC. The money is paid before the Internal Revenue Service can determine if the person to whom the refund will be sent is entitled to the refund. There is no effective advance qualification at the present time. And the crooks know that money is paid out without any effective advance qualification, and that's why the EITC has become a target for the crooks. Once the refund is paid by the IRS, it is very difficult to get the money back, especially from the fraudsters that are large, sophisticated, organized criminal syndicates inside and outside the United States that are stealing from the U.S. The IRS has been trying a variety of things to stop the fraud, but so far the crooks appear to be winning. Based on my prior experience, and not with the Internal Revenue Service, I'll add, I am concerned that the IRS may not be able to stop the fraud. 
My suggestion, therefore, is that HHS again be asked to initially qualify applicants in advance for welfare benefits and notify the IRS of the names of the individuals who have so qualified. The IRS can then match the names of those entitled to receive welfare benefits in the form of the earned income tax credit against taxpayer returns claiming refunds based on the earned income tax credit and reject claims from anyone whose name is not on the list unless those rejected can prove that they actually are entitled to benefits. Taxpayers are willing to pay their taxes if they believe that everyone else is paying his or her fair share. The amount of fraud attributable to identity theft today sends the wrong message because the public believes that others are defrauding the IRS and getting away with it. The General Accountability Office, on the other hand, last year placed identity theft and refund fraud on its short list of high-risk governmental problems that need to be addressed. So the GAO is saying this is a real problem for our country. Welfare programs like the Earned Income Tax Credit are very important programs that I personally support, and I'd like to make that clear. But one can support welfare programs and at the same time expect that they will be run without the added cost of the present level of fraud. I therefore urge the IRS to work with Treasury, HHS, and the White House to deal effectively to eradicate the present level of fraud in our tax system. Thank you, Terry. Hi. <clears throat> That's a hard act to follow. I'm going to do my best. Um, Thank you so much for the opportunity to join you today to discuss taxpayer service issues and whether the IRS future state plan as currently envisioned will adequately meet taxpayer needs. My name is Caroline Bruckner. I'm on the faculty at American University's COGOD School of Business. I'm also the managing director of the COGOD Tax Policy Center, which conducts nonpartisan research on tax and compliance issues specific to small businesses and entrepreneurs. At COGOD, we are currently fo focused on the tax and compliance challenges of America's latest iteration of small businesses driving the on-demand economy. These taxpayers are renting rooms, providing ride-sharing services, running errands, and selling goods to consumers online and through app-based platforms developed by companies such as Airbnb, Etsy, Uber, Lyft, TaskRabbit, Instacart, and others. Surprisingly little has been done to understand the tax compliance challenges this new frontier presents or how the on-demand platform economy impacts Treasury and IRS ability to fairly administer the U.S. tax code. Our research, which we are publishing next week in a report titled Short Changed, The Tax Compliance Challenges of Small Business Operators Driving the On-Demand Platform Economy, reviews these tax compliance challenges and endeavors to shed light on these issues. Having spent more than a year investigating this growing problem, we report what the existing literature has yet to acknowledge, that for tax purposes, on-demand platform economy service providers and sellers are, in fact, small business owners. And there are millions of them working and earning income in ways that are not readily identifiable by existing government research or publicly available taxpayer fi filings, filing data. A number of findings included in our research are particularly relevant for today's discussion. First, more than 2.5 million Americans are earning income in the on-demand platform economy as small business owners every month. Even at the low end, both in terms of participation and dollars earned, on-demand platforms grew by about 50% per year, making it by far the fastest growing segment of the labor market. Second, the explosive growth of the on-demand platform economy is the latest example of a 66.5% increase in alternative work arrangements for U.S. workers, which rose from 14.2 million in 2005 to 23.6 million in 2015. In other words, the percentage of workers engaged in alternative work arrangements defined as temporary help agency workers, on-call workers, contract workers, and independent contractors or freelancers rose from 10% in 2005 to 15.8% in 2015. As part of our research, we spoke with dozens of individuals currently participating in the on-demand economy and initiated our own survey of more than 40,000 members of the National Association of the Self-Employed. Our survey was designed to gauge participant, uh, participation of existing self-identified self-employed workers in the on-demand economy, as well as their understanding of their tax filing ob obligations. 
Our survey revealed that among respondents who earned income working with an on-demand platform company in 2015, which was approximately 22% of all of our respondents, approximately one-third did not know whether they were required to file quarterly estimated payments with the IRS on their on-demand platform income. 36% didn't understand what kind of records were needed for tax purposes for the income that they earned with their on-demand platform. 43% were unaware as to how much they would owe in taxes and did not set aside any money for taxes on that income. 47% didn't know about any tax deductions, expenses, or credits that could be claimed related to their on-demand platform income. And 69% did not receive any tax guidance from the shared economy platform they worked with. Our survey, taken together with our additional research, indicates that at best, a number of these small business operators are shortchanged when filing their taxes. At worst, they, fa they fail to file altogether. Moreover, a significant percentage of these taxpayers face potential audit and penalty exposure for failing to comply with filing rules that are triggered by relatively low amounts of earned income. The population we surveyed can generally be considered experienced, self-employed taxpayers when viewed in terms of their NACE membership. Yet their responses indicate a need for better outreach and, outreach and education of taxpayer filing requirements. Consequently, we think that the IRS should focus not only on the convenience of online accounts and its future state plan, but also on the education and outreach needed to educate taxpayers about their filing responsibilities prior to tax day. In addition, we think that any IRS st strategic plan should focus in part on the tax compliance challenges of the self-employed small business owner, not only because of their projected growth, but also because of the potential tax gap implications. Again, I thank you for the opportunity to join today's discussion and for the work that you do on behalf of America's taxpayers. As you know, I'm here representing ACA, um, but I'm also here speaking on behalf of the Federation of American Women's Clubs Overseas, FALCO, and the Association of American Residents Overseas, ARO. Our organizations have worked together for many years representing the interests of Americans overseas. We are pleased to have this opportunity to testify on the IRS's future state, and we thank the National Taxpayer Advocate for inviting us to this important public forum. I'm accompanied today by Charles Bruce, the legal counsel of ACA. To begin with, it is critical to understand the overseas American community and the current environment. There is no reliable figure for the number of Americans overseas or the number that should be filing tax returns. Non-filers exist for a variety of reasons, ignorance of their filing obligation, belief that their income is too low, or simply that they're overwhelmed by the complexity and cost of filing. Some bad actors deliberately don't file, but this is not the majority. This lack of information helps no one, neither the government nor the community. Americans overseas are diverse. They're business persons, contractors, aid workers, housewives, retirees, and that's just a short list. Without diving into statistics, the figures for demographics, such as average age and salary, is just that, average. These individuals are not inordinately high wealth. The reasons for living overseas relate to marriage and education, job opportunity, or simply birth abroad. Most write to us at saying that they want to comply with their tax filing obligations, but are confused by the process or fear making errors of oversight that will result in penalties geared towards criminal tax avoidance behavior. This community also has special needs. There are the mentally and physically disabled and those on low and fixed incomes. It is not our job here today to discuss the U.S. tax code. However, an already complex code becomes exponential for overseas filers. There are numerous forms and overlapping reporting information, such as FBAR and FATCA, frequent changes in regulations, differences in foreign tax systems and the U.S. system, which must be reconciled, high risk of making errors due to the complex rules. A move towards more simplified code geared towards Americans overseas should be considered. IRS outreach to this community, unfortunately, has not been great. There were a handful of IRS offices located, over, located overseas, but now there are none. The IRS website improvements have been made, but more needs to be done to consolidate and simplify. The human element is critical for this community. The ability to speak with a person for an individual guidance cannot be underestimated, especially with a complex tax code. For many coming into compliance, English is not their native language. Resources for this need to be expanded. Reliance on mail delivery is a problem due to the lag times and errors in addressing. Notifications often arrive after the due date for action. 
We support the creation of online tax accounts where taxpayers can check the status of their tax affairs and self-correct. Done correctly and with the caveats I will outline, these can be a big help for our community. Consider high-speed internet is not available in many geographic regions. Think of aid workers in Africa. Using internet cafes, public libraries for filing sensitive tax information is not acceptable for uh, obvious security risks. Use of cutting edge, te cutting edge technology may offer solutions, but many do not have access to these costly up-to-date software and computer systems. Security is a big issue. Identity theft monitoring systems are not widely available overseas. In addition, exposure and loss of personal data can lead to Americans overseas being identified and targeted for terrorist actions. Holiday schedules differ from the U.S. People work on their tax returns in their free time. A need for 24-7 support service in different time zones and an 800 number with minimal wait times. A team within the IRS dedicated to overseas Americans, staffed with individuals who have lived overseas and are knowledgeable in international tax filing. The IRS needs to locate the taxpayer and place them on a map with appropriate identification. For most, this is a social security number. However, many overseas filers do not have a social security number. The process for procuring one from overseas can be lengthy, as much as 18 months. Adoption of same country exemption for FATCA can help with this as it requires a one-page form identifying the taxpayer and where they reside. Upgraded tax preparation services. The IRS needs to couple online support with more professional cost competitive service options. ACA has assisted in this by developing a tax prepared directory found on our website. A U.S. bank account is needed to pay U.S. tax bills and many banks no longer service Americans who do not have a resident U.S. residential address. ACA is pleased to have addressed this issue with a product developed in cooperation with the State Department Federal Credit Union. Now overseas Americans can have a U.S. bank account without a U.S. residential address. This has been a big welcomed solution for many of our constituents. In closing, we would like to again thank the National Taxpayer Advocate for this conference and for inviting our groups to testify. We believe that while automation and simplification can help, it is the complexity of the tax code itself in the filing process, the number of forms, and the access to easily understandable and centrally located data that is a problem. We continue to advocate for a dedicated resource within the IRS for Americans overseas, a 24-7, 800 phone line, a dedicated team of professionals, a user-friendly interactive website with expanded language options. Our organizations are ready to help and we look forward to further dialogue with the IRS and the National Taxpayer Advocate and hope that they will look to us as a resource. Thank you. Thank you. Jeanette? Good morning. Um, on behalf of the National Disability Institute, I offer the following remarks concerning the IRS future state plan and our concerns for taxpayers with disabilities that are eligible for the VITA Earned Income Act tax credit. Given the five minute allotment for this testimony, I offer the disclaimer that brevity is uh, not one of my virtues. So my written testimony is by far more inclusive. And I also apologize to the interpreter sitting here working because I'm going to be speak speaking fairly quickly because I have many points. In preparation for this testimony, I reviewed available documents that discuss the IRS future state, reviewed research that is available on the characteristics and profile of taxpayers with disabilities. The only Two reports ever done were done by IRS Stakeholder Partnership Education Communication in 2007 and 2010. Uh, and also uh, working in my own 12-year journal journey, working across the country with uh, community-based VITA organizations, low-income tax uh, clinics serving taxpayers with disabilities. I was given pause as I did discovery of the backstory for this testimony. I was reminded of the late 1990s and Congress's investigation and abuse of the abuses of taxpayers. As a result, IRS was asked to reorganize, and it did. And many of us are here today because of that. Prior to the reorganization, IRS was focused primarily on processing, collecting, and examining taxes. After reauthorization, IRS was charged was going beyond revenue collection and assumed the role of education and national partnerships, building with community partners, which is the national today, IRS has over 60 national partners working in the uh, low income tax arena and over 4,000 community-based partners to ensure that taxpayers were educated 
advocated for, and represented for their tax disputes. With millions of taxpayers, this was no small charge. Several new operation divisions were, uh, in chains of command, were created, the Wage and Investment and the, the SPEC organization and the LITC, and they're overcharged with the oversight and education of the individual taxpayer particularly low income, and my remarks today are, are specific around taxpayers with disabilities that qualify for the earned income tax credit. And English is a second language, including deaf taxpayers, seniors, diverse ethnic groups, and taxpayers with disabilities. How does the IRS Future State plan to modernize tax preparation requirements for populations still part of the digital divide? Is there a blueprint for phasing this market segment in? providing free broadband and education if, in fact, that's the route we're going. We support IRS retooling business as usual and understand that technology is disrupting many of the old ways of tax service delivery. We request that IRS not lose their individual education focus for change from Congress, uh, from the charge from Congress, because for many millions of taxpayers, access to broadband, broadband and online services is still not fully available. A full list of those uh, statistics are in the, my, my written testimony. Over the past few years, IRS has reported increased hold time for taxpayers accessing free call centers, and we just heard that in the testimony with uh, taxpayers overseas. A reduction in the number of IRS taxpayer assistance walk-in centers serving taxpayers. And for many of you that don't know this, it's a, that was a hot place for people with disabilities to go because they had uh, like screen readers and they helped people do their taxes. They actually would hire an interpreter. Now appointments have to be made. We had concern about what would happen to those taxpayers. Where did they go? The community-based partners were thinking, how can we handle more taxpayers? As IRS designs the future state, my IRS account, similar to my social security account, it is imperative that a tool is developed that is customized and personalized based on the taxpayer's socioeconomic profile and experience um, of the VITA EITC eligible user. Taxpayers with disabilities with sensory, deaf and or blind, physical, mental health, developmental cognitive challenges, often experience barriers to access, whether through inaccessible technology websites, complicated content, lack of interpreters, English as a second language, or tax volunteers and personnel unfamiliar with accommodation strategies for taxpayers with disabilities. Many of the challenges raised by Congress in the late 1990s continue to plague tax, American taxpayers and are heightened because of the growth of technology. Issues such as revenue protection and identity theft that our commissioner just spoke about are listed as most serious problems that directly impact taxpayers with disabilities and low-income taxpayers. Today, our low-income taxpayer groups don't know who to trust. They don't know where to go or who to share their personal identification information with. For taxpayers with sensory, cognitive, or mobility challenges, access is even tougher. It is the wild, wild west for the low-income taxpayer, caught in the modernization of tax preparation using broadband when, in fact, they do not have access. We question the wisdom of Congress in withdrawing support to the one federal agency that is charged with and responsible for collecting almost $3 trillion in revenue for our country. The fact that 98% of all of our tax revenue collected by the IRS is paid voluntarily and less than 2% is collected through direct enforcement actions for individual taxpayers. It is amazing and critical outcome. 48% of the $2.8 trillion revenue comes from individual taxpayers, 45% of whom are within the 250 of the per, uh, percent of the federal poverty level. That is our market, regardless of ability, age, and ethnicity. 53% of taxpayers have an AGI of 25,000 or less, and with a disability, do not have access to high-speed internet compared to 5% of households with AGIs of 150,000 or more. Future state blueprint for the low, 
low-income tax population with or without disabilities is unclear. Most of the disability and LMI demographic do not use the online channels referenced in the future state documents I was given to review. Examples include online accounts with traditional financial institutions, brokers or retailers. In addition, most low-income taxpayers often do not own homes, have retirement accounts or savings. Rather, this demographic is much more likely to use the alternative finance industry, now estimated to be well over $70 billion a year. I respect 4,000 community-based partners and the low-income tax clinics have built a strong network beyond tax work. Their partners in the communities understand that the problem of hunger, housing, or tax compliance is not solved by individual programs, but collectively. The local community, which is the VITA, the EITC, the Tax Counseling for the Elderly, the Low Income Tax Clinic programs, and their partners are the economic backbone for low income Americans. They offer credit checks, budget, debt counseling, and financial education when there was none. Free tax preparation is now viewed as the gateway to a better economic life for millions of Americans. This issue is so much more than just a tax return. It is how it get, and how it gets filed. It means paying bills, getting a prescription filled, or keeping the lights on for one more month for millions of Americans. These are extreme issues many Americans face today. This is not a statement I am proud to make, but it is reality. I'd like to end with the voices of taxpayers with disabilities who wrote a statement to um, our commissioner in 2006 for IRS, um, when we first began this work, we went around the country and had focus groups asking taxpayers with disabilities, what would you like to tell the commissioner of IRS? I would like to, like to know how to, to do my own taxes. Someday you know, the services we are talking about may not be available for me anymore. We never have the opportunity to know stuff like this. Thank you, commissioner. Please simplify tax filing. We do not understand the forms, the questions, or the procedures. There are a lot of bright people here, and none of us can figure this out. I didn't file my taxes for 10 years because it would cost me my health care. I believe that for years. Most false information out there about taxes and benefits we don't know is false. People need to know what is true and what is not true. Sometimes word of mouth is not always true. We need advocacy from the IRS and others. If we go into a bank or credit union by ourselves, they don't talk to us. Minorities are treated differently, and people on SSI are treated differently. I would like to thank him, the commissioner, for the VITA program. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I have um, a few questions, um, some specific to each of your testimony, and um, some uh, that I've been asking everybody. And I'm going to focus for a bit on this issue of online accounts, and uh, which seems to be a, a core element of the future state. Um, and I was really struck, um, Mary Louise, in your testimony about the statistic that there basically high-speed, you know, digital access is only available in 32 percent of the world. Uh, we had testimony at our first public forum from Pew. Uh, research that said that 32% of U.S. households do not have broadband access, and that population is actually growing from year to year. So I'm really wondering um, for you and, uh, uh, you know, also, Jeanette, for your population, <clears throat> what what that access issue is. And I note that, that Mary Louise, in your testimony, you talked about going to cafes and things like that. That ties to Larry's point about identity theft, sitting in a Starbucks and having somebody peer over your shoulder as you're logging into the IRS account or being in a public library and forgetting to log out of your IRS account. So either one of you, if you want to elaborate on those, any concerns about that. Well, I'll just quickly say, I mean, it was pretty much in, in my testimony, but um, 
you know, identity theft, data theft, just the same things that, that people are faced with here domestically, having, you know, your social security picked up, your account, your bank account numbers, but sort of the added component that we feel for Americans overseas is being identified as an American. Somebody has your address, they know where you are, they know your bank account, and in the heightened world of, uh, of terrorists, that's th threats, excuse me, this is a big concern. Right. I think for the uh, disability population, uh, there has been fairly low access right now, so we don't have the research exactly, but we do know from uh, examples a few years ago in Tampa, Florida, where we were doing tax preparation with uh, group people in group homes, and um, there we actually caught some fraud. Uh, there was one of the social security numbers was being used by one of the uh, people that were preparing. So yes, there's, there's, but we just haven't even gotten to that point um, of, of what the research is showing on this. I think that um, with the population of the sharing economy, it would be a mistake to think that these people, while they are tech savvy, that they have internet access in their homes. They primarily have internet access through their phones. And trying to figure out uh, whether or not you can expense a certain uh, expense that you, you incurred in generating your business income, trying to do that research on your phone is incredibly frustrating. And I, I think we can all relate to that. And um, I would hesitate to, think, to say that the population of people that are earning income in the sharing economy, most of which earn, on average, significantly less than $10,000 a year, necessarily fall into the population of people that um, the majority of which have internet access from their homes and on their home computers. So I, I note that the IRS.gov is not mobile friendly at this point. So as you're trying to determine the depreciate the mileage rate and the depreciation right. of your automobile on a two inch screen and moving your finger up and down, uh, we actually also had um, testimony. Uh, again from Pew in our first forum where they interviewed people who only had sm cell phone access and were trying to do job applications and write resumes on, you know, online, apply for jobs online, and they felt significantly disadvantaged. They really saw that as a disadvantage. Um, I also, I want to follow up on the question about the sharing economies. Do you know what percentage of these folks are also might have a W-2 job? in addition to the sharing? <laughs> I don't have an exact number, um, but we do generally, um, J.P. Morgan Chase Institute did a three-year study on, um, which is the most comprehensive study on the financial transaction data uh, of a subset of um, a population of their customers that earned income from one of 30 platforms over a three-year period. And the vast majority of people um, in that study um, had um, predominantly used sharing economy income as a secondary source of income, and it was not the primary source of their income. So let me ask you this question. How, what is the best way to reach out to these taxpayers? Um, in the future state, and this would also be a question to Mary Louise and to Johnette as well, but I'll start with you, Caroline. Um, in the future state, the picture is that a taxpayer would create an online account and then the IRS would send targeted emails and information to them based on whatever their profile is. So if they said that they were, uh, you know, rented their home out periodically, they would get information. Um, so I'm wondering what you think would that work or, or are there other ways to reach out to these folks? I think that there are a lot of other ways to reach out for these folks. Um, I think that it's been noted pretty publicly the tension between getting um, an IRS notice via, via email and whether or not that's connected to fraud or a phishing scam. Um, I think that um, right now uh, there's a huge tension in the sharing economy over misclassification issues and that has taken up a lot of the debate about sharing economy um, work. And the challenge there is that the sharing economy platforms most of whom I talked to were more than willing to do more to educate um, the folks that they were working with about their tax compliance obligations, but were hesitant to do so over misclassification issues and potential litigation. And I think resolving that tension, um, or at least allowing um, third party preparers, um, the platform companies themselves, to uh, send information would be key. Um, I think in many instances, folks, once they uh, trip over the quarterly estimated pi filing um, 
uh, thresholds and realize that the first year that they go to file that they didn't comply with those rules, they get acclimated pretty quickly to paying taxes for the next year and subsequent years. But it's that first year population that you really uh, see a lot of um, <clears throat> penalty and audit exposure at. Well, as I pointed out in our testimony, um, one of the big problems that our community has is nobody really has a number on how many Americans are living overseas, and there is no sort of central casting. Um, uh, we, don't, we don't know. The State Department makes a general estimate on numbers based on, on some statistics that they need for their own staffing. So it's hard to know where these individuals are. Um, the same problem with communications via email with all the phishing and, and problems with identity theft, um, it, it would seem like a natural way to, to find these people once you know where they are um, and have identified them uh, to communicate with them. But of course, there's, there's, there's that component. And for our community with the hard copy mailing and getting a communication, it's equally as, as difficult because a lot of times people are not using maybe their foreign address. They're using another address as a mailing address. Um, they may be using a different address on their on their tax return or the IRS system simply from putting that address into into their system and mailing out from it is has an erroneous address. So it does it does pose a, a, a problem for the community to identify them, find them and communicate with them. What kind of outreach did the tax attaches do when they were in existence? Um, as far as um, I know, and, and I might refer that um, to um, Charles Bruce, um, the ACA Legal Counsel, um, the uh, Paris office uh, occasionally did um, uh, some uh, forums, some informational forums. We invited them up um, because we have a chapter in Switzerland. I don't know if they were doing that in Paris or London. Do you know, Charles? I know more about London. Lon London had a terrific um, IRS office in the basement. Right, I visited. Probably the best IRS office on the planet as far as service and giving answers. But of course, that's, uh, that's not there right. anymore. Um, um, so uh, when they were there and they were working, they could be really quite marvelous, not only for giving information, but also for calming people down and giving <laughs> service. But it was definitely a walk-in service. Right. I mean, there was no real, real outreach. But at least it was available. Yes. What, yes, and the calming. I'll come back to emotions and taxes. Um, Jeanette? Sure. Um, I think we already have in this country, and I think, you know, IRS has certainly spent the last, you know, well, it's 45 years, I think, since we've had the Earned Income Tax Credit, but the last 16 years really looking at the needs of the individual taxpayer. And this is not uh, something that has been able to, you, we can do alone as a federal agency or as a nonprofit, but you know, the work that we've been doing with the VITA and the community-based partners is truly a social impact model. Uh, it has involved uh, a federal agency, thousands of local community-based organizations, and then our private sector that's been doing the funding. Uh, and I think that the infographics that you, know, you have shared here that have been put forth by the future state uh, really need to uh, provide additional infographics that look at um, you know, Larry, the, um, the hourly service worker, and what some of the issues that he might have, which are very, very different than what was portrayed here. Or Mary, the, um, uh, I can't remember who I have here, Mary, the waitress taxpayer who's a vet uh, and has two children, one with a disability and has recently lost her apartment. And access to even our available services that are on the ground right now through VITA. I think the, uh, the existing uh, tax services for the low income really need, and I didn't address this in my, my testimony because it's, a, it's its own testimony, is communications. Uh, we have done a very poor job of communicating what is available to our um, low income taxpayers with and without disabilities. And uh, we have been testing. Uh, you know, the use of online do-it-yourself software through the My Free Taxes campaign for the past seven years that was funded uh, by Walmart to the tune of almost $40 million to understand uh, what, how are we going to make that transition. Uh, we have a lot of information and research on that. We found that our broadband, uh, the, the use of the My Free Taxes in the, in the surveys that we've done collaboratively with IRS and uh, the United Way Worldwide, Goodwill Industries, and National Disability Institute, we found that 18% um, this year of taxpayers 
taxpayers with disabilities, and these are with AGIs of 22,000, uh, were actually using the software. Uh, and about 20% were veterans with disabilities. So it's a very small sample, but it's, it's saying that, you know, this is, this is a possibility, this can be done. Uh, and we need a lot more research on that. But we need to be very thoughtful of these programs. And uh, I think as we're seeing the defunding uh, across the field for the low income, all the funders in the uh, for-profit world are saying, John, what's the next new big thing? And I say poverty. And, you know, they go, no, 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 no. And it's like, no, it, it's we, we not, we're the nonprofit world right now, we're, we're sustaining uh, an economic status quo for our low income Americans. That's all we're doing. We are not, we're not social impact investors, and we don't have that opportunity right now, even though well, I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of, um, you know, future around that. So this, so hearing this, this raises, um, I mean, I'm going a little bit out on the limb here, but the IRS right now is notifying members of Congress about turning on its online account for getting transcripts. And um, I thought I would just lay out to you some of the requirements to establish the online account, because it's not going to be that the IRS sort of emails you. It's going to send you an email saying you need, there's a message for you in your online account, and so sign on to your online account and see our message. Um, and uh, in order to have an online account, you have to establish one. And basically, a taxpayer is going to need either a uh, credit card that's in the taxpayer's name, uh, not a debit card, um, or an automobile loan, or a home mortgage, or a line of credit, uh, an equity line on the house, uh, in order to get through the first level. And then in order to really create the account, and this is what you need to do before you can even communicate with the IRS electronically, is that you will have to have a text-enabled cell phone that is a US-based phone number. Um, and uh, the contract is in your name, not pay as you go. Or it, you, if you're somebody else's name, you have to live at that person's address. So as I listen to that, first of all, leaving aside that it pretty much blocks out the entire you know, borough of the Bronx because um, nobody in New York has a car and nobody in New York has, you know, owns a home and they might have a, a credit card, but most likely a debit card. The U.S.-based phone, cell phone, would probably be a problem, so that means a problem for international taxpayers to be able to get onto this account and get a transcript. Um, and uh, I'm worried about the low-income taxpayers, but I'm also worried about affluent who have, you know, family plans for their adult children or their their parents um, who don't live with them. And um, so I'm just wondering how that changes your picture of the future of the online account and the ability to communicate with that. And if we could have those brief answers, because I want to ask Larry some questions in the last five minutes. Well, that, it, as you mentioned, that poses a, a huge obstacle for our <laughs> community, virtually blocks them completely out of, of being able to use online. And, um, you know, obviously online, um, I don't, I'm hoping you can hear me, obviously on, online and, and uh, um, more automated would certainly help our community because it's so dispersed right. and, and, and it's so complex as it exists right now. Um, but this certainly, you know, throws a huge wrench into the into right. the whole project because right. basically, you know, I, I can't give a percentage, but just knowing what I know from um, our membership base and what I hear from members, uh, you know, most of this they won't have, right? Especially the telephone, right? The telephone, right? Caroline, <laughs> I think that folks in the sharing economy, at least those that are uh, working for ride sharing. Um, that are doing uh, ride sharing uh, may have a shot at uh, meeting some of these requirements, particularly uh, they're likely to have a cell phone, they're likely to have um, an auto loan. Um, I think uh, similarly folks um, in the um, accommodation sharing space, folks working for working with um, VRBO or Airbnb uh, might similarly um, be meet some of these requirements. but. The sharing economy isn't just that. You also have to keep in mind that there are folks that are working for Etsy and other online sellers that might not necessarily meet these requirements. 
Okay, and Jeanette, if we can just briefly. I, I, I think uh, it's probably uh, would eliminate uh, a lot of the existing compliant taxpayers that with our low income and with disabilities uh, because, again, I think that um, access is, continues to be an issue. We know that about 13% of low-income taxpayers are solely dependent on their mobile phones, and many of them are working off of minutes. Right. So a lot of right. the, some so of the work that's gone on in the Connect Chicago, some of the work that's gone on around the country, uh, looking at how do we increase broadband in our libraries and, and uh, in our uh, public centers have had incredible responses. But their average users are, are with AGIs of 10,000. And um, they, are, they need transportation to get to these places. They're working two jobs. Right. Um, okay. So, Larry, I'm saving the best for last with you, in a way. Just to ask you a bunch of questions about the earned income credit, because this is something that I've been working on myself. We've had multiple conversations about this, and your recommendation about using, in some way, uh, HHS to determine eligibility, um, something that that you know, I've been talking with uh, uh, Australia and UK because they are moving in that direction of using their health and welfare departments to determine eligibility and then use the IRS in this way. Um, I'm just really wondering, as you've heard everybody talk about these online accounts, uh, where, where you see online accounts fitting into tax administration, uh, the concern about identity theft there, and maybe access, if people can't sign on to an online account, are they going to go to these unregulated preparers who might be able to create an account and get access to taxpayer information? You know, Nina, just listening this morning, it, it strikes me that one of the things that really is badly needed is a better understanding of the nitty gritty. We have too many people, me included, uh, oftentimes because of a lack of knowledge of the people that we're serving in this country. When we come forward and say, let's do this, let's stop doing this, or whatever, if we could have forums where we had people like you all that could give hard questions to the policymakers, I don't begin to pretend that these are easy issues. Part of the reason for, Nina, for, for suggesting that HHS become involved in the dialogue again. I don't know whether that's a good or a bad idea, but my reaction is where we're headed is to jeopardize, and we're seeing it happen. We're talking about jeopardizing our revenue system. My gracious, in light of our domestic challenges and foreign challenges, the one thing I would think everyone could agree upon is that our revenue system has to work and work well. We're pushing everything through our revenue system, increasingly. And my reaction is, folks, that's, that's, that's a zero-sum gain unless we start recognizing that there are competing considerations here. And so I would say, at a minimum, put HHS, IRS, and others together and start talking about the thing that we're not talking about in this country in terms of our big problems. So, um, as a little... I'm sorry, I don't know that I answered your question, <laughs> but... It was a great response. <laughs> um, I, I think, you know, where, where I've been thinking about the EITC, and I'm working on a, a legislative recommendation for this year, one aspect I thought of is we have a lot of people who are receiving Title IV or Title VIII benefits for children in this country, where the local departments have determined their eligibility, often through a face-to-face -face interview, or a more complex application process up front. And I've been considering making a legislative recommendation to change the definition for these benefits, whether it's dependency exemption or earned income credit, for the qualifying child to just say, if a state agency has granted you food stamps, welfare, housing assistance for a child, we should just take that. You know, because somebody else has done much more in-depth interview beforehand. And that sort of defines things that we're calling non-compliance into being compliance and gets a little bit more simplification into the law and a little bit more certainty. If there's been a face-to-face -face interview, then you have a better chance of knowing that that child really is in that household, which is what this whole thing is about. Do you have any thoughts about that? Uh, I think, again, I think it's a, it's a 
certainly part of the problem here when you start taking welfare programs and converting them into taxology into tax terms my gracious in terms of the american public i wouldn't be at all surprised that their reaction is i used to have certainty about my status but when you start putting it into tax language i have no idea where i am as complex as you make things when you put it in into tax language and make it part of the Internal Revenue Code. I would simply say that from the standpoint of the idea, this is one that I think, again, a good example. Why don't we, why don't we find some way to explore it in terms of what the ramifications are instead of, well, let's try it and see how it works out? Because what you're doing with your public forums is you are basically providing information to those that will listen about a wide variety of topics that I, th I know I didn't know anything at all about the low income tax community and I got educated folks through H&R Block and banks that were making refund anticipation loans. And let me tell you, I know how much they are reviled, but I personally learned more in the six years that I represented a bank that was totally counterintuitive to me. I learned about the unbanked community. And all I'm saying is for regulators, you've got to understand the details and the problems of who you're trying to deal with before you figure out how to try to start regulating them. Well, I think we'll, we'll close this panel on that note, but I think it actually makes the point that is, as Jeanette was saying, you know, Larry the service worker, you know, and Mary the waitress, or, you know, we have our shared economy folks and, and our international taxpayers. They each present very specific, you know, issues and challenges. And to think that Jane, the, you know, the middle school teacher is representative of that population and is going to be the user of the future is really not representative of what, you know, of who's going to need assistance in the IRS. So I thank you all. We'll take a 10-minute break. We'll come back uh, at 12 after 11 and um, start our second panel. Thank you all thank you. for being here. I really appreciate thank it. Thank you.